Uh, hi guys, by way of very brief uh, prelude, uh, we're going to have a chat for about half an hour or so before uh, these gentlemen will gift us with some uh, not seen before footage that didn't uh, make the final cut of the jinx and they'll walk us through that. Um, so it's my great pleasure to be here with these two gentlemen responsible for many fascinating documentaries. Um, if we have time I wouldn't mind asking you about uh, Capturing the Freedmans, which is a favourite of mine. Um, but of course the jinx, and you're all here because you're aware of the impact it made. Uh, I can't say of an HBO series that has been spoilt for me before by the front page of the New York Times, uh, which has happened with the jinx. Um, my first question is the broadest one before I hem to the jinx itself. It's a question that I ask myself a lot each week at a newspaper, and that is where do you find stories? How do you find a tap that turns on and stories come out? Uh, well, in this case, Robert Durst came to us. So, but, you know, the, the story came actually from a clip file from the newspapers. You find stories from other people telling stories to some extent. You know, w I had worked as a newspaper journalist, and um, I kept a clip file. There were several stories I thought that were worth keeping over the years. And um, after capturing the Freedmans, Andrew and I were sitting around trying to figure out what we were going to do next. I wanted to write a screenplay. I'd written a couple before. And this was the screenplay I wanted to write. So I wrote the screenplay for All Good Things. Um, and I guess during the making of All Good Things, Bob got uh, sort of interested in it. He had somehow, even though we had a lockdown on the screenplay, gotten a copy of the screenplay. And regardless of the fact that the screenplay didn't pull a lot of punches, it definitely showed him killing three people, he liked it. And um, he, uh, he started stalking the set. You know, there was rumors that when we were shooting in New York City that he was not far away, uh, keeping an eye on us. When we were up in Connecticut, he was staying at a hotel not far from there. Not, I didn't know this when we were shooting the film. Um, but afterwards, that came out. And, um, and then what happened was um, when the film was done and it was going through the process of, um, of uh, distribution and marketing, uh, Doug uh, sent us a letter saying he was going to sue us, um, Doug being Robert's brother. And... Uh, Doug said he was going to sue us into eternity. So I think this really pissed Bob off. You know, now that I'm thinking about it, I think this was the instigation for his, um, his reaching out to us because he hates his family, he hates his brother. His brother's a hugely successful real estate guy. He was the older brother, and he should have been the hugely successful real estate guy. And unfortunately, he was just stuck killing people. So, <laughs> so he, uh, he was going to kind of rub his brother's face in it. He called and he wanted to, he called the distributor, he wanted to talk to Andrew, my partner. And uh, we set up a meeting in Los Angeles and we went to meet Bob Durst. There's, you capture some of that bizarre pleasure that Durst seemed to take in that original film. Bizarre in that it wasn't a terribly flattering film. Right. What got him interested in the first place? You mentioned later his estrangement from his family was a driving motivator. There was a certain um, almost what vindictiveness perhaps um, but what originally, what was his attraction? Because I guess we're getting to a very bizarre individual. Psychologists would call his effect very bizarre. Right. What was the initial attraction, which then kind of led into this vindictive, vindictiveness against his family? Well, Bob has a huge ego. You know, there's no doubt. You see that everywhere. Um, even though he's a sort of quiet person, he has a vision of himself that doesn't necessarily comport with who he is. So... I think that um, he had a compulsion to confess. I think he has guilt. I don't think he's a complete psychopath. Um, and he had this feud with his brother, this need to, to say to his brother, yeah, you build buildings, but I get away with murder. You know? And every time he comes, you know, for example, Bob Durst comes to New York City, and the, Daily New this the guy from the Daily News photographer takes a picture. He's on the front of the Daily News. Doug Durst builds the Freedom Tower, and there's a little article in the back of the New York Times about that big. You know, so Bob loved to rub his brother's face and things. And I think that Bob also had had cancer, uh, or at least he said he had cancer, it could be lying. And I think he was at the end of his life and he wanted to, uh, he wanted to take a bow. I want to circle back to Durst because I think he's endlessly fascinating. But Zach, how, how did you get involved in this project? I, w I had worked with Mark and Andrew on a film called Catfish. And then after they had done the preliminary interview with, with Robert, um, and decided that they were going to make a feature-length documentary out of this interview. They hired me, and, and we started working on it together. Did you? We had a quick chat beforehand, and there were so many 
Adventure seems too glib, but this was very long, very painful, very taxing for you. Um, I should mention, as most of you probably know, uh, Durst is facing an, uh, another additional murder trial this year, largely as a function of the evidence these men uncovered. Um, at what points did you, did you start fearing for your safety? I never really was scared of Bob. I, I don't think I ever feared for my safety. My partner more so because he's more public. He, he got security. I mean, you know, Bob's a runner. If you look at all three murders, he runs after his murders. He doesn't, like, come after people, especially if it's publicized. So I, I didn't really feel scared. You didn't feel scared. Did you? I was slightly scared, only I had done... <laughs> 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 on one particular occasion, I had done a panel uh, <coughs> uh, related to another film, and I had said to one person, oh, we're almost done with that film, uh, the, the film, the, the jinx. I said, we're getting close to finishing the jinx. I told that to one person, and the next day, Andrew got a call from Bob's lawyer who said, we hear you're almost done with the film. That's so true, the Durst have fingers in everything. <laughs> so all my like, fantasies about them not knowing, you know, who, who wants to kill the editor? But they obviously knew uh, who... who uh... I want to kill the editor. <laughs> um, we've touched upon this very bizarre psychology. You believe to be a, a murderous man. Uh, he dismembered a body. He seems to have done so without little effect. Um, a vindictive man. Uh, opaque in many ways. I keep thinking of Durst's shark eyes. So they seem to be the most striking thing about him physically. Um, <laughs> the methodology of, of research and keeping in mind the... Um, does that resonate with you when detectives here say... Uh, I was going to tell you the truth uh, about Investigate, right. then interview. Don't interview, then investigate. That's my usual methodology. It's an upside-down pyramid. At the end of the bottom of that pyramid, you want to do your interview. You know, you want to get all the information and funnel it down so you know the answers. It's like being a lawyer in a courtroom. You, you kind of know the answers to the questions. You're looking for the subtleties, and you're planning the interview in a way that hopefully you get the answers that you know already exist out there. That's kind of terrible to say, but that's what you're doing. You're, you're, you're creating this sort of um, narrative. Um, but with Bob, we didn't have that chance because when he called, it happened very quickly. And I had not, I had kind of erased my memory on Bob I had a, we had done catfish, you know, we were on something else, and I went into it a little uh, naive, um, but when he started to talk during the interview, and the interview, the original interview is like three or four days, um, I started to remember things, and then very quickly I, I started to realize, so that was much more organic, I was more reactive. Uh, the second interview was more of what you're talking about. So there's a mixture between the investigative and uh, softer, develop, de developing a rapport. Right. with Durst was important in the first, first instance. Um, just one more question on the interviewing before I, I want to ask you, Zach, about the craft of, of editing something that presumably you generated many hundreds of hours of, of film. Um, but on the interviewing, the principal interview in this is obviously Durst, but you conducted others. And there's the hard investigative interview that was the second sort of interviews with Durst. How did you approach traumatized people, though? Um, I think most people who have seen the jinx, which is presumably all of you here, um, the most memorable part of the jinx will be, of course, the bathroom confession that comes you know, right at the end. For me, perhaps the most memorable thing was um, Susan Berman's son, um, adopted son from memory. Yeah. And this is a man who had ardently believed in the innocence of Durst, had seen Durst as something of a father figure, a mentor, and you then reveal to him evidence, the handwritten evidence and the look on his face. Can you talk to me about that moment, but also the idea of introducing very traumatic things and dealing with traumatized people, the delicacy of, of uh, fielding those interviews? I don't think I've done a film where people, where I approach somebody who was a, you know, a subject of the film or a part of the story, and they were like, yeah, this is gonna be awesome. It never happens like that for me, unfortunately. I would like to try that one day. Usually people are running from, from you. They're like, literally like, they hang up the phone, they curse at you. They don't want to open the wounds that have been sort of festering for so long. They're scabbed over and, you know, they just don't want to go there, you know. Um, with Sarab, you know, he was not as reticent as most because he had the self-righteousness of being Bob's buddy, you know. So he was still living it, which is really bizarre if you think about it. He was still in it in a big way because Bob was paying for his college tuition. He worked for Bob. He had made this relationship. He'd replaced Susan with Bob to some extent. So 
obviously the relationship with him has to be extremely pure. You have to be honest. And many a nights, he and I would go out with, with Sarabin. He's got the memory of, like, it's incredible. It's like, you know, he knows the whole Torah um, of, of Bob Durst. And he, uh, you know, he, he, and Sarab would kind of change his story, and Sarab, Sarab, and, and we would be honest with him. We would push him to try to, like, just accept the fact that possibly he was in a relationship with somebody who murdered his mother. Is that what you found, Zach, that there was a certain burden of delusion with Absolutely. him and, and, and you, what you had to delicately disavow him or disabuse him of that? Well, honestly, that's what uh, kind of caused him to look for the letter in the first place, was that he, we had been out with him and he had asked us, why do you think, it's obvious that you think Bob did it. Why do you think so? This was the day after we had done the interview. And um, one of the reasons that we cited was that they started communicating right after the missing person case of Kathy Durst had been reopened. And he said, that's not true. That's not true. They were communicating like years before that. I have a, le I have a letter that sh proves that it wasn't after the case that they rekindled their friendship. And he said, I'm, and we said, well, we're, o we're open to other possibilities. We'd love to see that. How did you do So this is a man that who probably at some point doesn't know who to trust. How did you garner that trust? Taking By him being honest. Right. You got to be honest with everybody, including Bob at some level, except towards the end. Once, you, once we found the letter, you know, all the gloves came off. But, you know. It was just adversarial at the end, wasn't it? it well, you know, I think he smelled it. What's incredible is that, you know, he must have smelled it a mile away because he kept turning us down for the second interview. And I think he was just so curious to know what we had that he couldn't help himself because he didn't show up with his lawyer like he usually did. He didn't no. show up with anybody. Are you, are you still incredulous that this, this great gift fell in your lap and the gift is this man's recklessness? Are you, st are you surprised or it conforms to everything you knew about Durst that he would sort of continue this sort of bizarre cooperation? Does it surprise you still? I'll start with you, Zach. Are you, are you at all surprised by the The only level thing I, I would disagree with is the gift because so much went into it. We had to go through 50 boxes of stuff where we didn't find anything to get to the point where we actually found something. Yeah, sorry. It's, by gift, I mean not the confession, but the, right. um, his, his very involvement and, and confessionalism generally. It's shocking. I mean, it's shocking, but it, it fits in his personality to me. Right. You the, know. the personality of the risk taker, competitive... And the ego. Ego, yeah. Yeah, that he could, like he, he could outsmart Andrew and Mark and I. Like he, that, that, that that was a possibility, you know. That just to, to, to walk into this interview is definitely crazy, but it's his kind of crazy. Yeah, it's very, partic very particular. It's signature crazy. Um, you mentioned all of the boxes, the files. Zach, how burdensome was putting this all together in the editing room? Well, I remember just when you said that, I remember there was a moment where we had this shelf I don't know, you might remember this, but we had a shelf full of binders and stuff, and we printed out everything. We printed out all the newspaper articles, all the transcripts from Galveston, and we were putting it all on this shelf, and I remember being in the edit room, and it was this loud crash behind me, and the entire shelf collapsed. Were you, were you ever... It's, it's a trope in uh, movies when they're trying to dramatize the act of journalism. There's always the pin-up board. And the, and the and little bits of all... Right, so how did you make sense of all of this? Because, right. <laughs> were, you, were you ever at risk of losing yourself in the details? Because you're accumulating an enormous amount of information over many, many years. How did you manage that? Were you ever at risk of, of losing yourself in the weeds? I think you have to take it all in. You know, that's always a possibility, but you have to kind of be like a sponge for most of it. And it takes... Part of what takes so long is just learning the material. I mean, we would tell each other the stories backwards and forwards. We know this because of this, and then play devil's advocate with each other, you know, poking holes in the theory, and well, what if this happened, or what if that happened? And I think that's super important. Right. You um, have to make choices. The most important thing is to make a choice at some point. We decided we were gonna be with Bob. So if we're gonna be with Bob, then a lot of the other stuff that's really interesting has gotta go away, you know? And so we decided that we're gonna start with Bob as a monster, and right. then we're gonna rejuvenate him as a human being. So that's a choice you make. And once you make that choice, mm. that's what... And, but, you know, the, the material tells you the choice. You know? that, the, the idea of characterizing somebody. I'm asked this a lot now with my book, whether or not it's simply a fluke or whether or not there's something more substantive in the culture that we're seeing this kind of renaissance of true crime, 
Uh, obviously, you're aware of Making of a Murderer, the popularity of Serial Podcast. Uh, is this a fluke, or is there something, something to it at the moment? I think the culture shifted, the crime culture. I think we were always watching crime. Law and Order is the most pervasive, uh, almost, it's everywhere, you know, and uh, there's been a lot of crime shows. But this idea of stretching these stories out used to be like one hour, one crime. Now it's six episodes, 10 episodes, one crime. <clears throat> that changed everything. And it really became more of a soap opera. So now you have actually people not just interested in the mystery of the crime, they're interested in the people in the story because you're cultivating that part of the story much deeper. So I think that's, that's what's changed. I think crime's always been a huge, I mean, Dashiell Hammett, it's always been a huge part of our culture. I think what do you crime, think, Zach? Uh, crime, what, what I, one of the things I love about crime is that when somebody commits a crime, it makes every detail of their life important. And I don't know of many other things that do that. Is there a risk, I've been saying this a lot in the last past couple of weeks, that my feeling, the episodes that I've um, just mentioned that are defined by a, an amount of sophistication, um, a certain comfort with irresolution and ambiguity. Um, certainly Capturing the Freedmans was wreathed in ambiguity. It didn't. Most dramas or depictions fear it, as if they'll lose the audience's interest. Um, were you aware of certain responsibilities to not make uh, something that is vampiric or exploitative my opinion is that the majority of true crime depictions, whether it's print or broadcast, is very salacious. If sex is introduced, there's a purience to it. Um, it's very exploitative and it appeals to our, the darker angels of our nature. It's not instructive, whether spiritually or intellectually. Um, is that an opinion you share? And what, res what kind of ethical responsibilities were you carrying going into this project? You know, there's a couple things you're saying that, you know, I'm like, hmm. You know, there, this idea that, you know, the luck of it. When we made Capturing the Freedmans and Andrew came and he said, hey, I want to make a thing about birthday party clowns. There was nothing lucky about that. I felt burdened by that idea. What was lucky is meeting David Friedman and hearing that story, you know? So there's no real luck in it. The, the journey is recognizing your luck or recognizing what's valuable in the story. This other, you know, what you're talking about also in the salaciousness, I never feel like that. I, I feel like we're doing something honest and we're fighting for the honesty of it. You know, I mean, we're not sitting up there going like, hey, Bob Durst is this, this devil. There's times when we're doing it. But we're also showing you the other side of Bob, which is also true. Bob is a devil and Bob is a guy whose mother jumped off the roof. So if we're, if we're telling the story honestly, then you get to experience it in an honest way. But you're right, there's a lot of crime stuff out there that's pretty salacious. I think people lean on that though because they don't spend the time to really dig in. It's just the easy, they take the easy way out. And I think that's where you find a lot of the salaciousness. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think most here would agree that the jinx distinguishes itself from uh, the pulpier, pulpier aspects. Um, we're gonna get back to a, a few questions, but now might be a good time to show the first clip. Uh, it does pose the question why he's wearing a wig in bed, presumably alone yeah, as well, right? waking up with hair in his mouth. Exactly. So one of the lighter clips of the three that we're going to see, but walk us through that, Zach, and the decision to obviously not include it in the final. Well, pieces of that are, are in the final, but specifically that, that's the kind of crazy the, story of him the lighting the hair wig on, on fire. fire. It just was a little bit of a bridge too far. Um, we, didn't, we didn't need it in the end, and... Him running to Galveston was already sort of a complex, complicated thing. That he seemed to uh, watching that. I re remembered again that the the detail that he furnishes in his stories, and he seems to relish that storytelling. What did you think of him? You guys are the storytellers. But what did you think about him as a storyteller? Was he credible? He seemed to enjoy it. Well, credibility is always sort of fleeting. You know, he, uh, he'll admit to a lot of crazy things. But, you know, I think that's also a technique to, uh, to make you think, oh, my God, this guy, he could never lie. But he does lie. So that's sort of his technique. But, uh, yeah, he's a, he's a, good, he's a good storyteller. I, I don't know if he's a good long-form storyteller, but in the short form, he's pretty good. Um, the next clip we're about to see, uh, I think, is the, um, the psych psychological examination. Um, the big question, and I think one of the attractions to true crime is, is 
Who is the killer? Wanting some intimacy with the killer's mind. Um, this next clip might or might not offer such a glimpse. And then uh, if we can play that now, we'll, we'll discuss it afterwards. Uh, so obviously the details of his mother's death were in the, in the final, um, as were his tender recollections of his mother. But the letter of schizophrenia was not. So Zach, can you tell us why that didn't make? Um, I think the childhood section where it falls in the series, like Mark mentioned, that we were setting him up as sort of this body chopper monster, and then in episode two, we're sort of painting him as a real person, and that, I think, have, including that and claiming that, that he was maybe schizophrenic kind of let the audience off the hook. Oh, he's crazy. That's what I thought he was. As opposed to, oh, I kind of can see a more... I can see a person here. So I think that's one of the reasons, one of the big reasons that we cut it off. It also tells the audience a lot, like exactly what to think about him, which was, which was something we never wanted to do. Right. Mark, do you have anything to add to that? That's exactly right. I don't think you can tell the audience what to think about the character that clearly. I don't know about psychiatry. I'm not a psychiatrist. You know, I'm not, I'm not capable of, of making a diagnosis for Bob. So all we can do is present all the information about Bob, let him present himself and let the audience make the decision. But you were making very deliberate and artful um, decisions about when to reveal what. Um, more, you know, as importantly, what to withhold and when, and when to reveal it. So is there a sense that um, the introduction of schizophrenia perhaps then precluded uh, an examination of m moral responsibility? That we could, or Durst was encouraging us, perhaps, to pin it to mental illness. Was there any sense that there was any trickery involved or that it might, um, it might preclude that moral, a sense of moral responsibility? I'm not sure I understand what the moral responsibility is. Is it his or ours? You know, I mean, ultimately, Bob has obviously got mental issues. I'm not somebody who can really, I'm not, this documentary is not about the psychological issues of a guy who kills three people. You know, this, mo this movie's about Bob Durst and how the audience interacts with Bob and how the audience feels about his actions and their decisions about what he's done. You know, so that's, that's the tension, is allowing the audience to figure out Bob Durst and to have some expert come in. I hate experts in documentaries. I don't think I've ever had an expert in that. Well, Debbie Nathan was in Capturing the Freedmans, but, but it just, it makes, it puts me off. It makes me feel like somebody's telling me how to think. Right. You have a bit more respect for the audience's yeah. intelligence. Yeah. Um, we'll go to a final clip. I'm aware of the time, so if we... We'll try not to forfeit questions. Um, this is a final clip. It's a shorter one. Um, and it's uh, like the previous ones. Much of this footage has never s uh, been seen before. And uh, it's from the, the bathroom. The now iconic, really. It's only been a year since it aired, but now I think we can say iconic bathroom confession. So uh, if you could please play that clip. So you wrote one of these, but you didn't write the other one. I wrote this one, but I did not write the Godabra one. And can you tell me which one you didn't write? No. Good. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And it's five after four. Perfect ah. timing. Can, can I have this? Or are you going to say? Yeah, yeah, I want you to have it. Thank you. Oh. Do we have Bob's bag nearby? Yeah, but we can wrap one up in an axle now. That's a sandwich. What are we going to do with that? I am going to go use the restroom, which is right here. Or maybe this is the bathroom. Yeah, that's... You're all right. This is the bathroom. There it is. You're caught.
that's in the house. Oh, I want this. A moment long that will be long remembered. Um, I understand that there's only so much you can say about this. This will probably be tendered as evidence in the forthcoming trial. Um, with that in mind, uh, the various legal prohibitions, what can you say about the, the, the final scene and the, uh, the discovery of that tape? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it was amazing. All the, the feeling that you all felt watching it, it was amplified a hundred times for us when we found that piece of audio. Um, it was found a, 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 a long while after that interview had been conducted. Um, and it was crazy. I mean, it was a, a, a intense, really intense experience to discover it. It came in stages. Um, it was a little piece was discovered by one of our editors, Shelby Siegel. Um, she found the part where he says, there it is, you're caught. And I remember she came into the edit room screaming. And I think I was on the phone. And I was like, yeah, yeah, one second. One second. Um, and then we went back to the raw footage the next day. And we were all in the edit room together when we pulled the, 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 the rest of that sort of bathroom soliloquy into the machine. And we could see sort of you know, a long waveform that he was going to say a bunch of stuff. And we were playing it and rewinding it and playing it and rewinding it. And, you know, and we got to kill them all, of course, everybody totally freaked out um and then the, the new york times splashed with that as well i'm sorry say that and then the new york times splashed with that your discovery yeah as well. i mean the the fact that it ran you know it felt so old the whole time you know 30 years ago 1982 all this archival footage it was all just in the past so the fact that um it ran right into sort of present day and you know the continued into the headlines immediately was something i don't think any any anyone involved expected this was hard, this one. Emotionally, it was very hard. I ended up in the hospital at the end of this one. You know, I was, I, it, was, um, it was a hard grind in the edit room to tell the story. But, you know, being a part of the story makes it so much more important. And the decisions you're making are actually decisions that are going to actually reflect back on you in a much more amplified way because you're actually in there. And you found that letter. And you set him up for that interview. And the question of what's moral and what's ethical and wh where you are emotionally becomes very much an internal question. Now, when people ask me, I, and you know, some people have said in the radio th th today, she was like, do you feel all right recording the guy when he's going to the bathroom? Is that ethically right? I, I, did, I didn't tell him to talk in the bathroom. He knew he had a microphone on. You know? Was it ethically right for him to kill three people? I'm not really sure where the boundaries are, <laughs> but I feel pretty good that we did the best job we could have of being morally correct. But it does weigh on you. You know, I think, I, I wake up a lot of mornings thinking about Bob in his, in his little room at the New Orleans Penitentiary. And, um, and what, you know, what a, at the end of his life, that's where his gift from the jinx, you know, it's, I don't think he should get away with murder, but it's not, a, it's not an easy thought. Zach, any thoughts on any, any <coughs> anxieties? No, I mean, I, it, it's amazing that it's had this sort of success that it's had. 
because I think the bulk of like Mark mentioned, it was really hard. It was, you know, f for the three and a half, it was three and a half years of banging our heads against the wall and thinking, is anyone ever going to see this? Um, so I'm thankful. I mean, I'm, I'm very thankful. I think we're, we're fortunate to be, to have been able to tell the story and, and tell it pretty well and be able to make it uh, something else. And just finally, you are starting to tell stories. I'm not sure how much you can reveal about it, but you are working on a podcast. I wish we just got a trailer for it. We should have loaded it up. So good. Uh -huh. So good. Crime. If you like uh, crime, more, it's going More be crime. Good. So organized crime in Rhode Island. It's the intersection. It was a unique time in, in American history where organized crime, La Cosa Nostra in the Italian sense of the word, which has you know, been gone over in, the, you know, in a glamorous way in movies and, and books for a long time, but they had basically co-opted an entire state. They had gotten into the judiciary, into the police force, and into politics. And um, for the, you know, just like Bob was at a stage in his life where he was ready to talk about his life, um, a lot of these guys are out of prison now, and they're ready to talk about their lives. And we've been recording these interviews, and it's, it's fascinating stuff. I mean, just the um, cultural identity of the city being one of, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a city where everybody sort of had their hand out, where's mine, the where's mine state. And there was so much corruption. And then, of course, like Bob, there's so much devastation in the wake of that corruption. So it's uh, everything from murder to taking kickbacks on construction projects. But it's particularly challenging because it's not one crime and it's not one character. It's sort of a soap opera of criminals, cops, and cor corruption that sort of spirals to tell you the story of the city. You did mention earlier that you wanted, right, like The Wire, the ambition for this is much greater. You want to tell a story of multi-tiered, multi-leveled city. Yeah. That, that the scope of this is much larger than, than a crime. Do, you, do we have a name for it yet? Crime Town. Crime Town. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, look out for that. Um, we're extraordinarily lucky to have these two gentlemen here, so please, please join me in thanking them. Thank you. Thank you.